this is the uh, Sunday following the Feast of the Holy Cross, which we celebrated last Monday. Uh, many of you were here. And uh, the cross, of course, is also a great symbol of Christian faith. We wear it around our necks, we display it in our houses, we show it. But of course, in the first century AD, the cross was nothing like decoration, decoration or symbol of anything positive. It was a cruel instrument of execution used by the Romans to make a statement. That statement was something like this. Unfortunate people die from the long, painful, and shameful deaths on crosses. Don't, don't rebel against Rome, or you might become unfortunate. The intention was to strike fear in the hearts of would-be traitors and rebels and tax evaders. The Romans were amazingly cruel and bloodthirsty. This, this kind of the rule was perfectly in line with the ancient polytheism and ancient morals. No one at that time honored the cross in any way, and certainly no one thought that the Jewish Messiah, the promised king of Israel, would die on the cross. Our Lord's disciples, like most other Jews, were familiar with prophecies, and they expected a Messiah who would be a successful king, someone like King David. King Solomon, who would destroy his enemies and exalt the nation of Israel over all the other nations. So it made no sense at all to his disciples when the Savior began to tell them that he would be rejected and that he would suffer and die and rise again. St. Peter tried to correct him. Jesus is called him Satan and said that he was thinking in human terms and not God's terms. Place the pursuit of worldly power over faithful obedience was a temptation Christ had already faced after his 40 days of temptation in the desert. And that same temptation came in the end of the The Lord let the people know in no uncertain terms that he, Jesus, must serve God, not this world. To place worldly success over sacrificial obedience was the work of the devil. Then Jesus, Jesus told his disciples, and threw them to us, what they, they really did not want to hear. He told them that they too must take their, their crosses and lose their lives, that this was the way to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Though it's shameful that the eyes of the world and the cross will become their instrument of victory, the false gods of this world will pass away. They will not save us. Instead, we must lose our lives in the service of the kingdom in order to become our true selves in God's image and His likeness. The hard truth that the Savior wrote to His disciples was that we cannot just advance to the joy of the resurrection. We must first go with the Lord to the cross. We must die if we want to rise again. So that Christianity is not a message of advancement and self-improvement. It's not a program, but it's death and resurrection. Christianity is dying to the world, to self, and living a new life in and for Christ. The cross comes to us today in many forms. We realize, of course, the literal cross of martyrdom is always with us. The world always turns against Christ and his followers. Although it might not make the news of martyrdom and persecution continue in the world today, Islam, we should remember, has killed millions of Christians over the past 1,300 years. The communists has martyred millions more than the 20th century. The Christians of Egypt have continued to be persecuted, as well as Christians in the Middle East. Will any of us be called? Literally to die for Christ as a citizen of martyrs. There is no telling. Persecution always is the worst in the battle. But even if we're not being killed, even if we're not being persecuted, that does not mean that we're exempt from the Lord's call to take up our crosses and to follow Him. Every last one of us needs to become a living martyr by dying to our sinfulness, to how we distort ourselves, our relationships. Christ offered himself in free obedience to the Father, taking upon himself the full consequence of sin and death to the point of death. He 
Yet this is out of love for us. us. By, By doing, doing this, this you'll open the way to the kingdom of heaven, to eternal life for you, for, you, for me, me, for anyone. The way is the cross. Because if we want to share the joy of his resurrection, of his victory over death, death we, we first, first participate in the struggle, the pain, the sacrifice. It doesn't mean we have ourselves nailed to a cross. It doesn't mean trying to put ourselves in situations where we know we'll be persecuted. It's not like convincing ourselves that all our problems are a result of someone else being unfair to us. It means we must die to our sinful desires and actions. We must crucify our habits of thought, word, and deed that lead us to worship and serve ourselves instead of our God and our neighbor. We must kill our obsessions and our addictions. We must give up hating our enemies, judging others, insisting on getting our own way, living only for ourselves, satisfying self-centered desires. This way of the cross has always been difficult. It's a difficult message. It's difficult to deny to sin, to deny to ourselves. It's difficult to do this, especially in a culture that encourages us to worship ourselves. We have enough money or social standing or how we think we'll be happy. If our body is in a certain way, we find the friends and spouses that we want our candidates and our teams win, we think that they'll be happy. If our desires are frustrated and get angry, we're tempted to, get, to hate and to condemn anyone who stands in our way. If we get what we want, we think we found the good life. So everything centers on us, our desires, our wills, our pleasures, our obsessions. The sad truth is that those who succeed in that kind of ideology are still miserable. They're still looking for peace and joy and fulfillment. They may gain the whole world. But they ended up losing their, their lives. lives. How, How many, many people throughout history have been poor on worldly stands, have had no power, no promise at all, and perhaps have literally suffered torture and denied as martyrs, but still have shown right and love and forgiveness and holiness. They saved their lives by losing their lives in the service of God and their neighbor. Just remember, of course, that people this past week in St. Sophia and in three dogs. St. Paul says of himself in the Apostle of the Epistle today, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In other words, by dying to sins and dying to his old self, his old life, and remember that Paul, Saul, as he was known before he became a Christian, persecuted the Church of Christ. By dying to all that, all the people that they like on the Lord, our Savior's glorification of humanity was made real in Paul's life. He became fully himself in the image and likeness of God by sharing the Lord's death and his resurrection. This is not about being miserable. The Christian life is a life of joy. God has poured out His Spirit in our hearts. It's about transformation and a new life. Think about this. I think that many things in life allude to the power of self-sacrifice, which we symbolize as a cross. What do you tell your children? That everything in life requires a certain amount of sacrifice. Why do I have to go to school? Why do I have to practice that issue? Why do I have to learn another language? And we tell them, you just need to do it. You just need to, to persevere through the pain and the tedium. You need to persevere. You need to stick with it. And then eventually, all that pain and all that frustration will be rewarded. You'll become competent. And it's important for children to feel competent about something in their lives, whether it's sports or sports or academics or whatever. But this is... This, this, this is what we tell them. them. This is really the message of the cross. That indeed, life comes through sacrifice. All of us, I think, in this life, all of us who are Christians, should aspire to a spiritual competency. We should know how to pray. We should know something about our faith. We should be exercised in resisting temptation 
in the loving arms and forgiving arms. We should know what the Christian life is about. So when others ask us about that, we're able to tell them. We're able to be competent spokesmen for our own faith. And that only comes by paying the price. There's no plan B. There's no easy path of a personal change and transformation. There's no easy way. St. Edmund is the missionary priest in Alaska. Alaska. And later, Dr. Paul writes this, this for, the for the Christian, the cross gradually becomes lighter and more joyful, while well, the non-believer becomes heavier and more burdensome. Why is this so? Because where the one carries their cross with the faith and devotion of God, the other carries it with grumbling and anger. The process is not about how we're happy. It's about asking what we can do for others. It's about loving others. From time to time, I think to myself, oh, wait, I'm not happy. I'm not happy. I need to retire. I'm not happy. 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 And then, then I catch, catch myself, myself. I, forgot I forgot for a moment who I am. I end up at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ, and I, I say, say to him, what? what? I say to him, get in. Oh, look at that. Lord, whatever you want, it's not about me. It's about me carrying my cross. It's about loving him and serving him. This is the cross. We see, we see the connection. If we want to share, share in Christ's life, life, we have, we have to share in his death. death. If, if we, we want to participate in his glory, glory we, we must share in his humiliation. If we want to become our true selves in Christ, we must die to distortion, to distortion and corruption. That's, that's, that's how we become the commitment to be in the first place. The commitment of baptism is like we have a commitment to be a lot of baptism. This is part of what explicitly takes place in the ministry of baptism. We're plunged into the water as it into to be grave, into to death, into to Jesus' as death for us, and then we emerge from the water into to new life, a life of Jesus Christ, a life lived in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us wear our crosses, and let us understand what that cross means. Wearing a cross is certainly the proclamation to Christians who are not ashamed of the Lord. Let us embrace the cross. The cross is the need of transformation. It's the need of paradise. The cross is the need of the kingdom of God. The way of the cross is the way for every single Christian. There is no other path to the kingdom. It's its death, but it is wrong. It is life. It's its freedom. It's love. It's joy. It is salvation. Amen. Amen.